Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining today. I am doing my first interview in a while, and I'm so happy that I get to do it with Olivia Stevens. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I'm just going to read from her bio real quick, and then we're going to get into the questions. I'm really happy to see that there's some people already here in the comments. So, you know, um, this is a live interview. So if you have questions, um, you can put them in the chat and I'll, you know, bring them up. So the bio. Olivia Stevens is a graphic novelist, illustrator, and writer from the Pacific Northwest. She earned her BFA in illustration from the Rhode Island School of Design in 2017. Olivia has illustrated for a number of sites and publications, including the New York Times, The Guardian, and Fire Magazine of Black Speculative Fiction. She is the author of the middle grade werewolf graphic novel, Artie and the Wolf Moon, which is going to be the main topic of today's interview. She's also the creator of the romance webcomic, Alone. Currently, Olivia is working on Darlin and other Darlin and her other names, a werewolf western horror romance comic that she plans to self-publish online. When not drawing, she enjoys listening to torch songs and observing tree trunks. So, <laughs> I read your bio before because I had to copy and paste it into my little script over here. <laughs> but I don't think I was really paying attention because I didn't see that last line about torch songs and I oh. don't know what are. So now I have to ask you, what's a torch song? How'd you get into those? Oh, torch songs, like general description is just like a song of longing love it's like most songs are written in some way as a torch song so okay. any song that's about yearning i guess <laughs> yearning for someone um like you hold a torch for someone that's where it comes from Got yeah it. and i just love i love love songs so yeah that's what i do <laughs> and what's the gnarliest tree trunk you've ever seen? Uh, gnarliest was probably, I was in Oregon in January. So probably back then I was, um, yeah, Portland somewhere. It was like, it was like on a neighborhood street too. It was like splitting the sidewalk in half and I like had to like oh. climb over it. Those are my oh, favorites <laughs> where it's like the nature's winning. <laughs> Those oh, are the okay. best tree trunks. Yeah. <laughs> I think the gnarliest tree trunk I've ever seen, which is kind of why I asked, was I had been into some park, I was just walking through the park, and there was a tree trunk that looked almost like a seven-toed foot. Ooh. I was just yes. like, yes. Wow. <laughs> <Love. laughs> Last year. <laughs> Where this thing comes to life and grabs me. Yes. But, <laughs> no, I love, um, like, if you could see my wall right now, I have these, like, big, uh, forest tapestries that I put up on all my important walls. But yeah, I just love looking at them. The gnarlier, the better. <laughs> oh, I guess we're kind of talking about this, but how do you like living in the, the Pacific Northwest? Oh, um, I mean, I was born and raised here. So this is home. I have, uh, I've lived in the East Coast. I lived in Providence for school and, um, I spent some time also living in Oklahoma and um, those times were very formative, but they also taught me that like, this is where I should live. This is where I meant to <laughs> exist. Um, so yeah, I love it here. Um, good and the bad. It's, it's home. Um, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I feel like a lot went unsaid and that those times were formative. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Not even close so to being out. Away by the East Coast. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I have like a catchphrase at this point where I'm like, I'm about to get candid. <laughs> so yeah, to be candid, they were formative and they taught me a lot. Um, do you find yourself incorporating certain things about the about the Pacific Northwest, like into the art you make and the stories you write? Yeah, um, I didn't do it intentionally at all. Uh, but like the stories, I've the first um, big story I did was my web comic that I started in college, and that was uh, that's a story that's based in um, the childhood home of my mom. Um, she grew up in Stevenson, Washington, which is a very small town that's like on the edge of the uh, Columbia River that separates Washington and Oregon. And that was like the first 
big story I was doing. And um, I said it there just because, you know, I, I had visited there a lot because my uh, grandmother lived there. And um, I don't know, there's just, there was just some quaint, beautiful thing about that place. Um, and then uh, when I started making Artie, I guess, um, I had not actually, you know, done a lot of like landscape drawing at all. But like while I was actually starting to draw that book, I like fell in love with it. Um, and it became this thing that just it like awakened something in me. And so now, yeah, I think like all of my stuff that I'm doing now is very much informed by like the natural landscape of the area and I like I just my phone is just full of like um pictures of trees that I see <laughs> and uh all that stuff so definitely informs like the way I draw the natural world a lot um whether it be intentional or just stuff that I've internalized from living here all my life uh and then just the area in general like the Pacific Northwest is a weird place and it's like, I, I just feels like a very perfect setting from living here. I'm like, this is such a weird off kilter region where like weird stuff like this would happen. Like the fact that like Twin Peaks is based here. I'm like, yeah, no, this, this tracks though. This makes sense. So yeah, just, I, I feel like, um, this area definitely plays into why I'm drawn to the supernatural to an extent. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I, I haven't seen Twin Peaks, but I feel like Gravity Falls is set in the Pacific Northwest. Yes, Gravity Falls is in Oregon. So it's just like, it's a, it's an elusive, odd place full of uh, a lot of uh, eccentric characters. I would say, yeah, including me, but. <laughs> Thank you for sharing all that. Um, <laughs> I was wondering on terms of like your, I guess your journey as an artist, what got you into comics and what did you decide that, you know, you're gonna draw and write? Yeah, so I've been drawing and writing since I was like a toddler. Um, so like, I remember in like elementary school, we had, um, writing workshop which is where you get to we had like an hour that was dedicated to us getting to like write and like publish our own little books like picture books and i was like a menace and um would write like 60 page oh, no. <laughs> installments that would like break the stapler <laughs> that they gave us and like uh, we had an editor, which was a teacher who would go through the spell check and I would be like, go, I would be on like a four book, like the fourth book out of like a six book series that I had planned as like a seven year old. <laughs> um, so I just always really loved telling stories and like the pictures were always a really important part for me. Um, but I didn't, I didn't uh, get to comics until like middle school. Um, so I had actually, I had done like NaNoWriMo all through middle school and it like blown the word count out of the water. But all of my novels, I had illustrations alongside them. Cause I'm like, no, this needs pictures though. Like I'm describing it, but it's not enough. Um, and then middle school happened and I like, fell like head over heels into like anime and manga and that just like snowballed into me just I was obsessed with like comics and especially like web comics um I followed a bunch of web comics and that was just like my life and I started trying to make web comics and stuff in like high school without really having much experience with the form and so I would start these like long um epics in high school that just went nowhere because I just I didn't really know what I was doing yet um and then I didn't get serious into comics until like my freshman year at college um at art school I took a comics course in my freshman year that like 
taught me how to like not only understand how a comic works like how to communicate through a comic but like the last assignment was about finishing a comic which is something that i had not done um and learning to finish a story is a skill in a, in and of itself that a lot of people never learn and it separates the people that like want to tell stories and the people that can actually tell stories you have to finish it and so I learned to finish things. And after that, it was like no looking back. And um, I spent the rest of my college years like updating. Um, my final project was actually like alone. And so I started it as like this updating web comic that served as like this portfolio, this living portfolio um, that I, you know, I would uh, print up little uh, copies of the web comic and sell them at like, uh, some local conventions as a student and I would kind of like get to know people and stuff. And I met some, I met some people at the shows that like seven, how long, like seven, eight years on, I'm like, Oh my gosh, we're like peers now. And it was just so crazy. Um, so I spent, yeah, I spent all of my college just hustling to make comics, print comics, get my comics out there. And then um, I, my web comics actually led to already happening because um, I had been, I, I got an email from an editor at this publisher who was like, I really love your web comic. If you ever think of doing kids comics then send me whatever you have. And I was like, I had never thought of like doing anything for kids. Um, all of my work had been, you know, written for like an adult audience or whatever. Um, and so my final project was actually like developing the pitch for Artie. Um, and just the whole, it was like an experiment. I was like, let me see if I can like even write a story with kids in mind and like see it through to a completed pitch. And um, the rest is like history, I guess. But yeah. <laughs> An audience question. Where do you publish web comics? Uh, web comics are published on the web. You can, um, when I was updating my comic, um, I had, uh, I have my own website for it. And so um, I would update the website or you can um, serialize it on like a bigger web comics platform. Like there's like Tapas and Webtoon and stuff. Um, and I would update it there. And then I would kind of use my social media to be like, hey, it updated. And um, it's just, it's less of a, um, I mean, it's got definitely gotten way more centralized since I started, but it, in general, you can literally just like have your own little website in your own little corner of the internet and self publish all you want. And, um, you know, I think it's like a really magical kind of space where word of mouth can like carry this like little tiny story that you didn't expect other people to see and it creates this little niche community um and i think that's the beauty of like uh web comics is that if you want it can be like this your own like little corner where you just play with this story and have like this little audience around you um and you don't have to i don't think people realize that like we don't have to play into like these big centralized social media platforms as much as they want us to believe we have to. Yeah. So anywhere, you can publish them anywhere. <laughs> so how was the transition for you going from publishing the web comics to going through Learner? Is it an imprint of anywhere or is it its own? Yeah, uh, Artie is technically um, at an imprint at Learner that's called Graphic Universe, which is their just whole graphic novel imprint. Um, so that transition was like, well, first of all, the transition in general was hard because um, it was like the longest comic I'd ever drafted. Um, and so uh, it was hard to kind of, um, figure out the story all at once, I guess, or at least um, 
figure out the the script and draft the script all at once because a web comic can have a very like meandering sprawling pace where like you don't have to have it all figured out before you start sharing it with people and like going from that to like a published book is well you finish all of this work behind the scenes it takes you like three years and then you wait like another year for it to come out and so there's like this veil of secrecy and like super delayed gratification that is like the opposite of web comics it was really hard for me to adjust to um and i think i only survive that by having like a trusted group of friends who are also working on like things they can't share and so we just show each other like this is what i'm working on right now they're like oh this is what i'm working on because otherwise like the best part of about web comics for me was just being able to like get immediate feedback on stuff that you had just completed while you're in that moment. And like, I love the feedback I get about Artie, but it's also something that like I wrote when I was, I wrote it in 2018. So I was uh, like 22, 23, and now I'm 27. And like the work for me is old now, mm. but, but now people are only like, seen it now and so it's like i was kind of a different person when i made this but i'm glad you liked it but yeah it's um the delayed gratification and like the delayed response and feedback can be uh that was definitely an adjustment for me yeah <laughs> out of curiosity did you ever write fanfic or was it mostly original stuff i never i've never written fan fiction and i think the reason was like whenever I got super into a series or something, I would read other people's fanfic, but I it just inspired me to work on my stuff. Mm. Like that energy didn't translate to, I need to write about these this other person's characters. It's, ooh, I'm energized to now like write and improve my own stuff. Um, and it's like, even with fan art, it's very hard for me to draw fan art unless I am like hooked. And so like the fact that I drew like not just one, but like multiple pieces for Our Flag Means Death, like that means something. Cause like you cannot like hoard my attention away from my original stuff that long. So yeah, it's hard for me to, it's just hard for me to invest that time in things that like aren't mine, which mm -hmm. sounds awful, but. <laughs> I mean, I feel like it makes sense. <laughs> oh, we had another audience question. Is your relationship different with your webcomic audience versus Artie's audience? And if so, how? Um, very different. Um, I have not, coming clean out, I have not updated my webcomic since I started working on Artie because trying to do both of those at the same time would have definitely killed me. Um, but like, the webcomic audience is so much more like th the connection is just more intimate because um, there's no middleman there's no publisher in the middle that's like distributing and stuff and like the audience with arty um there's just there's i i try to keep like a little bit of distance I mean, I guess also there's the age thing too. Like, yeah, there's the age know, thing too. Now, it's like yeah. children are the target demo. Yeah, so like I keep my distance for the most part just by being, you know, an adult who, <laughs> who doesn't um, interact with a lot of kids in my day to day. Um, and I still get like very sweet, very sweet messages from like parents um, who like let their kids talk to me like, um, through uh, Twitter messages and stuff that always warms my heart. But like, it's just, yeah, it's just, I don't get that same level of like feedback, I guess. And so um, really, I just rely on um, the, a few reviews here and there that were positive. I'm like, okay, well, they liked it. Hopefully other people are liking it. I won't know about it. Um, I stop reading reviews when the book comes out. Like 
my um, browser has like all of Goodreads is just blocked. So like, I don't, I don't hear any of that stuff because even like, even the positive stuff can make me anxious in, in the weirdest way um, where it's like, I get anxious that like my next thing won't be, um, won't, or I guess I get anxious that my next thing won't satisfy a reader as much. So it's like, there's this pressure now, even with like positive feedback I can feel. Um, so yeah, it's just in comparison to webcomic audience, I just, a lot of the times I just don't know what the discourse is about the book or what people are even saying about it. And that is also what gives me peace. <laughs> I guess that's kind of baked into like fanfic and web comics is that you're going to be talking to people who look at your fic and be like, oh, thanks for commenting. Or, yeah. And that's yeah. kind of the opposite pretty much of how publishing goes, I guess. Yeah. Personal and indie. Yeah. And it's like a lot of people like in the web comic sphere, like they kind of know me as a person a tiny bit just from like my social media presence. But like with traditional publishing, these are like complete strangers across the pond, across the world, who have no idea who I am, which is like, if I stop to think about it too long, <laughs> it can get very uh, intimidating, I guess. But um, yeah, it's just the distance. That's the, that's the main difference, I think. So... Not a lot of intro questions, but I feel like it's time to get into Artie and the Wolf Moon itself. So I unfortunately don't have a physical copy with me, but I'm going to share my screen and we'll see how this goes. I haven't shared it in multiple people before. So this is kind of a, this is the cover. You can get an idea of what the art looks like um, for people watching at home. And I'm just going to leave it up for a few seconds and I'm going to take it down. But I, I really like this cover because I feel like this is kind of what I remember about your art. Like I remember the reds. I remember a lot of attention to like motion and people running. Um, <laughs> and like the focus on lighting, I think is something yeah. I remember a lot as well. Because already does photography. So there's like stuff from her in the dark room. Um, her as a werewolf. Lighting is very important in the story. Yeah. Yeah. I think this was the first, this was like the first sketch I sent in. And I was like, this, you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Artie and the Wolf Moon is about this young black girl. She's in her preteens, right? Yeah. So she's like 13. 13. Okay. Yeah. And she lives with her mom in this town, in the Pacific Northwest. Her father died like, around when she was born. Um, yes. Sorry if I'm getting these details a little bit. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <That's completely laughs> um, but her dad liked to take photos and she has his old camera and she's very into photography as well. And she's kind of having some issues at school with being bullied, but over time she realizes that she's a werewolf and actually she comes from a very long line of werewolves. And her mother's kind of intentionally been keeping her from her extended family who are werewolves. And so it's about her um, learning more about her family history. It's about her finding out what happened to her dad. There's vampire battles, there's cookouts. There's a lot to love about this book. Um, <laughs> is there any other context you feel like I should give before we get into the- No, I think you summed else? it up pretty good. <laughs> Perfect. So, there, Artie and the Wolf Moon, I talked about, has vampires and werewolf lore, but there's like a twist to it. When and how did you decide that you're going to put your own spin on these like pretty like well-known, you know, paranormal memes? Yeah, so um, I think the secret is I watch a lot of bad supernatural television. Um, and I love it. <laughs> Um, for all of its flaws, like I'm engrossed by supernatural creatures. And um, I think a lot of people are maybe into them uh, as kind of a way to deal with horror or something. But I like 
really identify, I guess, with the supernatural creatures in a lot of ways. And um, I've always, I don't know, I've always had like an affection for like the monster in a story. And um, I've always kind of identified with the monsters in a story. And just that idea of like um, being different in some way or living differently than society um, finds acceptable and being misunderstood because of that and maligned and villainized. Um, that's the angle of monster that intrigues me. Um, and so, yeah, I, um, I watch a lot of bad supernatural television and I watch it because I like to watch those things and think about what I would do differently and um, how I would frame things. And, you know, that's kind of where I started. I uh, was thinking about what I would write a story about for children about what it's what was um inspiring or interesting to me when i was that age and it was like supernatural creatures and monsters and stuff and you know having powers was a big thing especially um reading all the manga and watching all the anime like having a normal kid who suddenly gets these abilities and has to understand the world through that lens that's something that's always interested interested me um so yeah, I just decided I'm going to write about this because this is what I'm passionate about and I'm going to write it the way I wish I could see it written. Um, especially in regards to like, I want to see these monsters through the lens of like a black queer person because I feel like um, oftentimes um these creatures are kind of used as an allegory for queerness or um, marginalization, but it's never like through, like, it's always like a straight white person who's a monster. And then they, we kind of have to be like, oh my God, it's just like if they're gay. I'm like, no, what if they're literally just gay and a person of color and they're also this creature? Um, so that's, I just wanted that. Um, so that's why I, uh, went down this road, I guess. And um, the stuff, uh, the lore, I guess, that I ended up settling on was just me writing um, informed from my perspective of um, being a queer Black person and um, just kind of, I was, I've always been um, very interested by history and um, the idea of um, ancestry and being able to trace ancestry has always felt very elusive, um, you know, because yeah. we often evaded record or our records were destroyed. And in a way, we that history feels can feel as elusive as, you know, whatever goes bump in the night. Like, we don't know what's out there. Um, I don't know a lot of details of who came before. And so kind of blending that speculative nature of the past, our past, with the speculative nature of um, like a supernatural cryptid, I don't know, that just like meshed with me. Um, so I decided to combine them in a way that I felt was more empowering than tragic, I guess. Because... Mm. Um, I I bristle a little bit at um, framings I've seen of the book where it's like, this is a social justice take on werewolves and vampires because I, I don't think it is to the extent that others might. I guess for me, it's an informed perspective of those issues, but I don't think that's what the book is like about. I think the book is about um, community and finding that community and um, those bonds and um, the surrounding circumstances of like racism in the Pacific Northwest and um, escaping slavery in the past and stuff like those are circumstances but they aren't the story 
Um, like I would never consider my life or the life of my family to be um, defined by those things. They're mm -hmm. informed and influenced for sure, but um, there's so much beyond that um, in the black life and the the black experience. And that's kind of what I really wanted to focus on, like that joy, that community, that resilience, and um, just being able to reach across differences and um, kind of combat um, issues together. So that, that strength of community was definitely like the thing I actually focused on is like what the book is. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like other authors, um, authors of color in general, Black authors in particular, have kind of shared on social media about how some people view their books as like a learning thing. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially in science fiction and fantasy, it's, it's science fiction and fantasy. Like it could be an allegory for stuff, but like that's usually yeah. like the first reading. Yeah, I, I, um, I've talked about this a lot with my peers and, um, what I think it is, it's it's a flattening. The The book can only be about the one thing. And so they notice like the little bits of like racism or discrimination that are, you know, artifacts of the book, not really what the book is, but they see that and they're like, that's what the book is about. Because I don't think a lot of people appreciate the vastness of Black experience and that we can uh, contain multitudes. And so they kind of cling to like, oh, I, I recognize the suffering as what Black life is. So that's what the book is about, hmm. even when it isn't. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because I feel like even though it's been like months since I read the book at this point, I can still remember like the scenes with the parties or like the get togethers or stuff that happened in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and as the, much as the fight scenes in the running. Yeah. It's just funny because it's like I paid attention to like scene length while I was working on the book. And I was like, I want the joy and the happiness to outpace the suffering by a mile. And it does. But um, it's interesting to see the moments that people like latch on to, <laughs> despite like me trying to kind of be like, OK, we're going to offset the dark parts with like way more light. But, you know, yeah. Random question. I Have you read The Good House by Tanana Reeve Do? No, I have read um, My Soul to Keep, though. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was just wondering, because I was like, oh, as you're talking about, like, oh, I wrote this book about, like, you know, life in the Pacific Northwest and, like, this house that's, like, been in my family for years. I was like, oh, that's, like, very... Oh, no. Very nice. I have not I read that, but it's on my I list. Know what the book was, but I was like, oh, maybe she's heard of it or read it. Oh, <laughs> no, but, no, I loved, um, I love the African Immortals, so I will definitely, I'll definitely check that one out, because I got my own horror stories about that kind of stuff. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, in terms of, like, um, the lore twists, I think we talked a lot about the werewolves, but I also thought the slight tweaking to the vampires was like very interesting as well like the vampires are not sympathetic yeah <laughs> no the i don't think they are <laughs> they're the, um, monster monsters at this they're the monsters <laughs> and um i've gotten a lot of flag for that <laughs> um i i i do get uh notified of some feedback from time to time it's like the Twilight people really did not like, <laughs> not like this book. Um, oh, but it's like, I'm like, they're lost. It's like, as petty as it sounds, if people who like really ride or die for Twilight hate my book, then I feel like I did something right, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, the vampires are evil. They're an evil force. Um, <laughs> and I wanted them to be scary in a way where it's like, this can't be solved by killing them. It's like, no, that just will open up a new can of worms. Um, yeah, no, straight up, no sympathetic vampires in this story. No, I really like that. So I was like, oh, wow, this like really changes the emotional stakes of these fights, like in terms of what they can do and also like- Yeah. 
some questions that come up later on in the book. I was like, that yeah. was a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> Thank <All> you. <laughs> So we talked a little bit about how like the joy and the relationships are a big part of this book. And I was wondering if there's a favorite relationship that you explored in Artie and the Wolf Moon. Yeah, I mean, I think the big central relationship is Artie and her mom, um, which uh, people have asked me that if it's based on like my relationship with my mom and it kind of isn't. Um, <laughs> we have a very different, I mean, we have a similar but also a different dynamic. I think Artie and her mom's dynamic is like um, is similar to my mom, me and my mom's dynamic in that uh, me and my mom are very, very close um, to the point where we don't talk because we are just on the same page, like so much that like we don't have to when we're in the our, the presence of each other, like a lot of times it's just silent, but like, that's just the vibe. And like, I don't have to fill the air with unnecessary speech and she doesn't feel the need to kind of like fill the silence and stuff. Um, Cause we're just on the same wavelength. But I think with Artie and her mom, that silence is detrimental in a lot of ways where, um, I think Artie's mom thinks that she is protecting her daughter, but in actuality, she is um, not healing and um, not speaking to her daughter about these things might feel like protecting her from the bad things, but you can't, um, you can't protect your kids from what's going on or what has happened um, in that way because you're depriving them of information that they need to um, like navigate the world. Um, and it's like, you want to, you know, keep your kids from having to know these things, but they're gonna find out at some point. And you want it, hopefully you would want it to happen. Um, you would want them to experience those things with, the knowledge you gave them and the tools to navigate those situations instead of just keeping them in the dark like that. Um, so that was a favorite. That was like the central relationship and like why you write the book and stuff. Um, and also just um, Artie and her friends and like friends <laughs> in the book um, where it was this interesting um to come at that because Artie has not experienced a lot of positive attention from people her age and so when being given sudden positive attention from like two different sources it's like I can understand kind of her jumping at both of them and being like oh my gosh I've never friends <laughs> i have friends and so like having that lack of positive attention i think um can enable kids to tolerate behavior that they shouldn't and tolerate dynamics that they shouldn't because this is like they've never received that kind of positive attention at all and so when the negative things crop up they're like but I haven't had this before and I don't want to lose it. Um, so that was, that was interesting for me to figure out too. Um, but I just, I don't know. I just love like writing like extended family kind of dynamics. Like a lot of the, a lot of the um, wolf town folks are like modeled off of like relatives of like friends or like my own relatives, like my um, reference library for this book has a bunch of old like cookout photos from like me and like my extended family and like my friends. There's several friends are like just straight up in the book. Um, and that just made it for me, like I did that because I wanted it to feel like real um, and it's, it's easier to do when you're like drawing those people like straight from the heart in a lot of ways. Um, and just like, 
I don't know. People, I, I, I'm very quiet in my family. And so I spend a lot of time just like observing the funny stuff people say to each other and like how they act around each other. And um, I think that's why I was drawn to, yeah, some of the antics that the <laughs> extended family get up to. I'm just like, I'm kind of just um, sharing my notes on stuff that I've noticed in like other families and stuff. <laughs> Did any of your friends or family like read the book and are like, this is yeah. me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, right away. Um, my dad. <laughs> my dad is um Mac in a lot of ways. Um, he's like, is this me? <laughs> or no, he texted me. He texted me, he's like, so is there anyone in this book that you would say is a <laughs> and I was like <laughs> a little bit, um, and like the aunt um is She's kind of based a little bit on my own aunt. Um, I wouldn't say like there are any of them are like one for one. Like I, I notice little quirks in people and then I'm like, oh, that's that's fun. Um, but I would never I don't think I outright like steal anyone and put them in the book because I would feel like I would feel really uncomfortable if someone was just like, <laughs> hey, I made you a character and I think this is exactly how you act. <laughs> No, I get that. <laughs> um, I had another question about relationships. So in this book, Artie has a crush on another girl, which is kind of like a, a subplot. It's like a background to the story. Yeah. I was wondering, why did you include that relationship? And what do you think is like the role of romance or romantic subplots in middle grade? Um, so I included it because I didn't have a good reason not to. <laughs> uh, I didn't want it to be like a big deal at all in the story. I just wanted it to be like a little thing that happens. Um, a lot of people, uh, <laughs> I think some people have made it like bigger than it is and like kind of asked like, so is this like part of the whole, what this book is about? And it's like, I don't think it is. Like technically my book is like a queer middle grade, but I don't really, <laughs> I just wanted it to be like a background element, I guess. Um, and so as far as like the role of like romantic subplots, I don't, I don't really have a strong opinion either way. Um, I think, um, I think adults and maybe, you know, people with kids maybe, um, have a st way stronger reaction to this kind of stuff than the actual kids in a lot of ways. Um, and like, as someone who writes for kids and is written for kids, I feel like a lot of the times the stuff that we are writing has to be approved by like the adults. Mm -hmm. And like, it feels like the kids are like the very last people that get to be like, but is this a good book? <laughs> and it's like, they're just kind of given this instead of, um, there's just no, like a lack of direct feedback from the kids on what they actually want. And it's always just like kind of adults guessing, which bothers me. Um, but I don't know, the role of romantic subplots uh, depends on, you know, the story, I guess. I, um, I don't think they're, as far as like the stuff I write, I don't think they're like a huge deal. Um, I try to make them just like a background element. Um, I do think that in this day and age of like book bannings and stuff, I uh, it's important um, to showcase um, queerness in children and um, to hold up that mirror in some ways. Um, but yeah, that it can get dicey because when I wrote that, um, I wasn't thinking about, you know, book bans and like this backlash that's happening and this censorship that's happening. Um, and then once that started rolling out, I just like, I don't know, you just, 
start thinking back on, I was like, was it really that it was one, one page in a book and suddenly the whole thing is just taken off the shelf. Um, so it's just, I feel like there's so much power now in it and like including that stuff that like I wasn't thinking about when I wrote it. And it's like, it's not something that my peers, when we're writing it, we're just like, yeah, because a lot of us are just, you know, gay. So like, this is something that we're like, yeah, that'll be cute. And then, you know, there's like pitchforks and stuff after the book comes out. And it's just, um, there's so much power being given to it. Um, which I don't know if that's fair or not, because, you know, it's just a book. <laughs> that's my attitude on a lot of this stuff. I'm like, it's just a book. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't, I can't really say much about getting kids feedback because I'm a whole adult who reads middle grade <laughs> purely for myself. Like this may or may not trickle down to any of my cousins. <laughs> Probably won't. <laughs> So how do you like to incorporate getting feedback from like your target audience into your work? Um, so yeah, I, um, the kids matter most. <laughs> I, I only get a few far and in between. It is mostly um, adults who are um, giving feedback, but like the kids, um, I want to say the kids don't have a lot of the hangups <laughs> that adults have. And it, it inspires me to, um, uh, you know, keep an open mind and uh, write as freely as I want to, because like the kids are just so amazingly open-minded and imaginative and, like I have, so above my desk, there is, um, there's a printout of a uh, seven-year-old um, Oliver and his mom sent me this and it's um, some wolves that he drew after the, he, they read the book and it's about like future wolves that like go to space and they transform on the moon and like I printed that out because I'm like, that's such a good idea. idea. And like, <laughs> and it's like, it's just, I find that so beautiful because like, I don't think about, I feel like adults, myself included, were so hypercritical of like everything. And like, while I was making it, I was so like hypercritical and just, um, down about books, my book, and just seeing the flaws in it. And um, I think with kids, even if it's maybe not their favorite book, they still have so many like thoughts and ideas that expand from it. And I don't know, it just, it, it's the kind of thing that just inspires me to like, I'll make a weirder one next time and see what they do with it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> like the kids, the kids rein me back in because a lot of times, you know, you see what, um, what other adults in publishing want. And that's what you're actually like, you're pressured into being like, okay, this is, I think this is what the market is dictating, I guess, even though like that kind of rubs up against what creativity is. <laughs> and so you're kind of feeling like, you know, closed in a lot of the time and just cut off from creative possibility. But the kids, the, cr the kids have nothing but creative possibility. And that's what I find so inspiring about um, the ones that I've heard from. It's just like, I'm like, no, <laughs> this is about imagination. We're going to, we're going to go as far as we can go with this. And, um, you know, if it sells, it sells. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But, you know, at least I, didn't I didn't self edit myself before I even got the story out, which I think is something everyone can fall victim to and does fall victim to is you want to 
create something that's maybe wacky and um, goes against the grain, but you're self editing because you see, you know, oh, this kind of story, I don't think people, uh, people would pick it up or people would like it and stuff. It's like, no, go crazy, go wild. <laughs> I had a question about the art on Artie and the Wolf Moon. So we talked a little bit about the red, like the red eyes, the red motion lines. And I'd never seen red motion lines before. Like that really stuck out to me. And I was wondering if there was like a reason why you did that, if there's like some artist who inspired you. Um Yeah, I um so all of so um red for me is like a through line in all of my work. Uh my web comic is a uh, limited color so it's black and white and red um and the red is there to like accentuate like really emotional moments because i just find red to be a very passionate evocative color um and like all of my comics that i've done uh, most of them have been like limited color stuff but it's always like limited color but red to accentuate a moment. Um, and I kind of pulled that over into this book. Um, I, this book was stressful for me color wise, because like I, I wasn't working in full color and this was going to be a full color book. And so um, I tried to utilize the red to mean, not mean just any one thing. Um, so the red motion lines for me, in my um, artist brain logic were like to differentiate because there's also like white motion lines in the book um, and like the red motion lines, I wanted to kind of denote like, this isn't just normal strength, this is werewolf strength. <laughs> um, it's a whole different level of strength and movement. And, um, and uh, yeah, I, I used red for the eyes, motion lines, and uh, some scenes with the vampires too, I think. But like, I also use blue a lot because I think red and blue like butt up against each other in a lot of interesting ways. And so um, both the werewolves and the vampires in the book have different hues of red and blue in them. So like the werewolves, I use very like vibrant, saturated blue um, and vibrant, saturated red, kind of like to instill like liveliness, I guess, and um, vitality and energy and um, kind of passion into them. And then the vampires, they have like this very, um, in the night scenes with them, I use like this very kind of sickly greenish blue, very pale color um, to kind of denote like the sense of lifeless, lifelessness about them and that like nihilism streak they have. Um, so yeah, I, I think a lot of color is like intuitive for me. Um, I start all of my art with like the lighting first. So like my sketches, incorporate all the shading where the light is coming from. And then using that is, um, as my base, I kind of work from there and think about, you know, what emotional beats I want to hit in the scene and also how light might instruct the viewer to feel about um, certain characters or certain places and stuff like that. But the red is just, I think that's just like my go-to color in all. <laughs> in all things. <laughs> um, did you have a favorite like panel that you drew in this book? <sighs> favorite panel, oh gosh. Um, I think, <laughs> so my favorite page that I drew is page 246, I think that's what it is. I think I memorized it. Um, and that's just like, a, that's just like a page of like black joy. And this is, that was like my favorite page to draw, but I think like in general, any page or panel where Artie like grew into her powers or like was kind of experiencing her powers and um, 
that was like my favorite stuff to script and to draw is just like her coming into that power and really harnessing it. And um, definitely near the end, there's this part with Artie's mom coming into her power. And that was, <laughs> that was also very fun for me. Yeah. <laughs> So like five minutes from the interview ending, I wanted to kind of start to wrap things up. Um, what products do you have coming up and what should we be keeping an eye out for? Right. So I took this year off. I was lucky enough, fortunate enough to have savings and an artist grant that allowed me to take this year off and like kind of recalibrate, figure out what I want to do. So next thing that is up is... Um, a comic that I've been working on my own this year um, that I'm going to be self-publishing uh, near the end of the year called uh, Darlin and Her Other Names. Um, it is a werewolf story that is in a very different vein than Artie. This is a story for adults. Um, <laughs> and it is a story that um, is set in the 1880s in the plains and um, primarily in Colorado and Kansas. And it is about two people who are um, recuperating and healing from trauma. <laughs> and um, I, the basis of it is that I wanted to figure out what a werewolf story would look like in the midst of uh, the United States uh, mass wolf extermination campaigns, um, which is like an angle that I haven't really encountered a lot as far as like werewolf stuff is like um, addressing the fact that the United States um, pretty much wiped out <laughs> wolves because they were perceived as this threat. Um, which a lot of times they weren't, uh, most of the time they weren't. And so I wanted to kind of delve into that with this story and kind of uh, delve into that and also delve into um, different migrating groups of people um, colliding with each other. A lot was going on in the 1880s. <laughs> and I wanted to kind of delve into that historical perspective while also unpacking um, some of my own traumas, I guess, um, as like just a black woman trying to survive in America. <laughs> so there's a lot of, there's a lot of different moving pieces in this one. Um, and it is for adults. This is a horror <laughs> werewolf comic, but I'm really excited about it and I'm really proud of it um, already. And so that should, I'm working on it. I've been working on it for a while and the first part should be out by the end of the year um and then from then on i don't have i don't really have anything else um on my slate that's i'm still figuring out what i'm gonna do you know <laughs> but for me that's kind of exciting for darlin is that going to be a web comic or is that going to be something what we that we can buy yeah, that's going to be a, yeah, that's something you can buy. It's going to be a PDF release, I think. Okay. Um, that's what I'm planning anyway. Um, it just depends on what my work life situation is going to be by the time it comes out. But I'm planning on it to just be like a PDF that um, people can buy. So, yeah. In terms of the wolf thing, that is very interesting, though, because I don't know. Like I remember I had mentioned something about like a food chain in my area. Like there's a lot of deer by me. Like I'm in the suburbs, but there's like a lot of woods. And so there's deer kind of all over the place. And I was like, what around here eats deer? Like, and I was just like, well, all, all the carnivores would have eaten them. Yeah. <laughs> like, been pushed out or they get shot whenever they show up. They yeah. Services or whatever. So like really nothing <laughs> eats the deer now. Yeah. So like this story, uh, I, I want to get meta about werewolves because it's like werewolves are painted as this vicious, mindless beast that's based on like our perception of wolves as like this vicious, bloodthirsty animal. 
that they actually aren't. <laughs> and it's like, what are we perpetuating with werewolf stories when we make them out to be this mindless, strong, bloodthirsty thing that they often aren't? And so a lot of the werewolf lore of this new story is just wolf biology, which is like so far removed from what like people uh, think wolves are or think werewolves are. Um, and it's like, what's what's it like to be like maligned in that way and completely misunderstood? It's just, it's gotten me very introspective about like what werewolf stories have contributed to in a lot of ways. Yeah. So I'm excited to be done with it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Also have a graphic novel adaptation out now right uh, yes the hole in the sky by kwame and Balio. yes um tristan strong punches a hole in the sky the graphic novel um adapted by robert venditti i did the art um laura langston did the colors uh gosh shoot. ariana mar did the lettering am i forgetting anyone i don't think i am um yeah that came out Two weeks ago, I've lost oh, wow. all the time. I didn't realize it was that recent. No, look, what day was it? Oh, a week and a half ago. <laughs> Listen, it's been a it's been a week. Um, yeah, so that came out recently. Uh, oh, and I have a series um, at Mad Cave Studios, uh, The Tiger's Tongue. It is a high fantasy royal series. Um, about two twin princesses duking it out for control of a crumbling kingdom. Uh, and the first two issues are out through Mad Cave. It's a five issue limited series. And I think the next one comes out sometime next month. So yeah, that's also a thing. Um, but I think that's it. Well, pretty sure. I'll put those links in the uh, description <laughs> box of the video if people want to circle back and take a look at those. Um, and then I just want to share some comments from people because there was a lot of love for your work in the comments. <laughs> I 100% would have checked this out of the school library ah! and the school just based on the cover. <laughs> cover is so lovely. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Teacher says she loved Artie. Oh, uh, the extended family aspect was my favorite part. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, I just want to share all that. <laughs> and this has been a little over an hour, so I'm going to sign us off. Thank you so much. Olivia for coming to this interview. Thank you everyone for watching and sharing your comments and your questions and have a good day, everybody. Oh my gosh. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs>